Life is a struggle. Without struggle, there is no challenge to bring out the depth of our beauty and our strength. 40,000 children die every day in this world of disease and violence and malnutrition. Ah, what's going on? And we must go home now and register every unregistered person. Our movement is from Selma to Soweto, from Los Angeles to Angola, and from Jackson to Johannesburg. Dr. Joseph Lowry, I'm so glad you're here to have this conversation with me. I appreciate your time. My privilege, my <laughs> pleasure. Thank it you is. for having me. Well, I'm glad you're here. And I want you to start with me here. You are called the Dean of Civil Rights by so many, yet you call yourself a preacher, an advocate, and a professional agitator. Why do you use those <laughs> words to describe yourself? I don't remember the professional agitator part. <laughs> do you I agree? I think somebody else called me that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm a preacher. I, I, I feel called of God to spread his word. And that's been my, that's been my joy, uh, that he chose me, unworthy as I am, to be a vessel of his gospel and his love for us as his creatures. Uh, advocacy, uh, I think that's the nature of the gospel. The gospel is a plea for a reconciliation of those who are separated from themselves, from each other, and from God. And so the agitation, uh, <laughs> I was first called at by a little old lady in tennis shoes in Mobile, Alabama, <laughs> uh, was a member of my church. And uh, when I left Mobile for Nash to go to Nashville to serve in the bishop's office, uh, the local paper said locally that local agitator leaves town. And I was offended by it. Are you still offended today? No, because she took me home with her and told me not to be offended and showed me this brand new washing machine that she had in her house. And she said, you see that red round thing in the middle? She said, that's an agitator. And she said, no matter what kind of detergent you use, no matter what brand of washing machine, nothing happens positive until that agitator does its work. It separates the dirt from the fabrics, the clothes. So don't feel bad about being called an agitator. So after that, I, I, I wasn't bothered anymore. <laughs> I don't know how the professional part got in there. <laughs> <laughs> you embraced it then? Yes, yes. I, I, if, if agitation means trying to stir the waters so that creative tension can help us separate the, the wrong from the right, the just from the unjust, I, I accept it. I plead guilty. You were born in 1921 in Huntsville, Alabama. That's correct. I'm a northerner. That's North Alabama. That is North Alabama. <laughs> and you grew up at a time when African Americans had very few rights. What do you recall about your early childhood? I remember an instance uh, when I was, my mother carried me to a railroad station to go to Chicago. We had uh, relatives in Chicago. And once a year, at least and sometimes twice, we would go to Chicago. Now, Huntsville was on the, south, the uh, Southern Railway, which didn't go to Chicago. But Decatur, Alabama, 24 miles uh, uh, sort of uh, west of Huntsville, the L and N went to Chicago. So my father carried my mother and me to the station in Decatur, and, and we went in the waiting room. My mother was very fair-skinned. And the police officer came in and looked at us and said, hey, you can't stay in the colored waiting room. You have to go mm -hmm. next door to the white waiting room. She said, okay, I don't know where I was, but she found me and carried me into the white waiting room. Then he saw again, he saw me. And he said, uh-uh, he can't stay in here. And she said, well, he's my boy and I'll go wherever he goes. And so she started back to the colored waiting room, but the train came and as I recall, we got on the train. But I, I worried about that for a long time and asked my mother about it. I was a small lad, mm -hmm. but I, I believe as far as I can Recall now that was my first cognizance of, of race and racial distinctions and racial discrimination. Your parents wanted you to have a good education, so they put you on that train and they sent you to Chicago for five years when you were roughly 11 years old. Yes. You went to grammar school at St. Elizabeth's where you were taught by very strict nuns who you say yes. beat you more often than you deserve. Well, beat probably is not uh, whipped, whipped, uh, punished, uh, usually in your hand. Uh, 
uh, with little switches, mm -hmm. sometimes a belt, sometimes, a, but, but more often than not. But I, 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 I treasure that experience because, uh, because they taught. They really taught. They cared about their students. And I learned uh, in that school. And uh, uh, I was disciplined. I learned to respect discipline. I learned to respect religion that was not mine. I was Methodist. And uh, the, the Catholic, uh, the catechism uh, was different to me. Even at that young age, I recognized the distinctions. But I learned to respect another religion. So I think I'm more tolerant today of, of different religions, Christianity, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, uh, and, and the family of Christianity within Catholicism, Protestantism. So I, I'm more tolerant because of that experience in that school. You ultimately wound up in college, a Presbyterian college in Knoxville. And it was at that time that you decided that you did want to be a preacher, even though your father had decided that you should really go to law school and be a businessman. So what prompted the decision to become a preacher? Well, you know, when I was a little boy in Huntsville, uh, several pastors told me, probably because I made so many speeches in church. <laughs> My mother was in charge of almost every program. And you could go out of the back of our house on Church Street, across the vacant field to Jefferson Street in the back of the church. So I went back and forth. I had a, we had a little path that my family beat uh, through this field to the church. So I made speeches. And one minister, Reverend L.G. Fields, said to me, boy, one day you're going to make a preacher. And I told his son, who was a good friend of mine, I said, you know, I thought your father was intelligent until yesterday <laughs> when he told me I was going. So the seed had been planted, but I'd ignored it, trampled on it, pushed it aside. Well, as a young boy, you resented going to church and said, as a young boy, I'm not going to go when I'm an adult. Yeah, so that I'm, was a 180. When, when, when uh, you know, when you're forced to go, <laughs> you have this rebellion that when I get where I can make my own decisions, I'm never going to church. But when I got to college, there was a, uh, the college pastor who was a Presbyterian preacher named Evans, was very inspiring. And, uh, and he, you know, resurrected the, the, uh, the, the thoughts and the feeling that, that this, this planted seed, uh, which lay dormant for so many years. So finally, I decided to stop, stop running and, and uh, accept the call to preach. And you did in several churches throughout the South. And then along about 1955, you met Dr. Martin Luther King in Boston at a seminar. Do you remember your first impressions yes, of him? Yes, uh, he was a scholar, but uh, I was impressed with him and didn't see him again until <clears throat> he came to Montgomery to pastor the Dexter Church, and I was pastoring in Mobile, and the Alabama Council on Human Relations had a meeting, and we both were on program to, to make contributions, and uh, I admired his speech. And he was kind enough to say something nice about my <laughs> speech. We engaged in the usual preacher exaggerations about, you know, you're a great man, so <laughs> forth. But we were attracted to each other and promised to uh, exchange pulpits and come and preach for each other uh, from time, uh, at some time in the future. But uh, he was a, an attractive, uh, scholarly fellow. But in spite of his scholarship, he was warm and down to earth and friendly. And, and, and winning, he had a winning way. Was it easy to be friends with? Yes, we, we developed a friendship that, uh, and once the boycott started, uh, I was heading the Ministerial Alliance in Mobile, and uh, I read about the, the boycott. The bus boycotts. The bus boycott in Montgomery, and read something in the paper that disturbed me. It was that the, the demands of the movement led by Martin asked the city fathers to let blacks begin seating at the back as they were and fill up if they did, but that they would not have to get up if a white person got on the bus. Rosa Parks was up front because the bus was full. When a white passenger got on, she was asked to get up. She refused. Well, I called Martin because I said, we already have that in Mobile. We don't have to get up if we fill up the bus. He said, well, you're right, we should ask to sit first come, first serve, but it doesn't matter. They are not going to grant this request. It'll make them look foolish. It'll make them look stubborn and, and determined to hold on to segregation. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll win anyway. And he was right. They turned down the request, and the rest is history. <laughs> well, in that time frame, you actually started with 
Dr. Martin Luther King, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which had started informally conversations uh, with you and, and others, Abernathy and, and others, and, and ultimately formed this organization that you were vice president of. Yes. And the, the Mobile situation, the bus boycotts in Mobile, went relatively smoothly, but there were violence and, and outbreaks in other areas. So at what point was the decision made that we will go forward with a nonviolent movement, and did you think it would work? Well, we weren't sure. It was Martin's idea. We, we knew very well we couldn't win a violent battle. Uh, we checked the black army, and it was non-existent. Our Navy didn't even have a foot tub with water, nor even a little toy boat. So we knew we couldn't win, that all the police officers were white, all the uh, military uh, divisions were white, and so we couldn't win that kind of a battle. And, and so we, we agreed that we would take the nonviolent approach. And we called on a group called Fellowship of Reconciliation, FOR. And they still exist today. Glenn Smiley, the white Methodist preacher. And they conducted workshops uh, and taught us how to, to react uh, to potentially violent situations in a nonviolent methodology that could temper the situation. So when we rode the bus for the first time in Mobile, I was heading the group, and so they said I should ride the Pritchard route. We were out five, which was out into Klan territory. And Reverend Sam McCree, pastor of Mount Zion Baptist Church, and I rode that bus, and uh, we were went along for, I guess, the first uh, 10 or 15 minutes without any uh, incidents at all. We took the first cross seat and then a fellow got on with a bottle in the sack. Uh, and obviously there was something in the sack that was uh, disturbing him and he had been imbibing. And he sat on the first, he sat on the side seat right behind the driver. And for a block or two, it didn't occur to him that two black men were sitting on the front seat and there were a couple of white people behind us. And, but it did finally occur. And he told the bus driver to make them inward fellas get back. And the bus driver said, you ride, I'll drive. I'm in charge of the bus, just ride. And he said, by God, if you don't, I will. And so he got up and Reverend McCree and I said, well, here's our first test <laughs> of the nonviolent <laughs> workshops. And uh, we sat there and uh, he started toward us. And one of the lessons was if you can take the initiative. So I took the initiative and said, sir, it's dangerous to, to stand up on a moving bus. Please sit down. We mean you no harm. I'm sure you don't mean us any harm. Please sit down. And the most two surprised, most surprised two people on the bus were Reverend McCree <laughs> and me, <laughs> that he did sit down. And we said afterwards, by it works. Nonviolence worked. And, and we felt good about it. And we reported that back to the workshops and to others. And so nonviolence became... Uh, hopefully uh, for many of us a way of life, not just a, a methodology. Move with me to the very historic voting rights march from Selma to Montgomery. Can you give me the historical thumbnail sketch of what happened in the planning of that event? We went to Selma and uh, remember we had diverse personalities in SCLC and then you throw in <laughs> SNCC and it was a grand uh, array of great minds and spirits and determination but strong wills. So there were heavy discussions and heated debates. But on Bloody Sunday, uh, uh, Dr. King did not come back. He stayed in Atlanta at his church and probably, and has suggested that they probably ought not march that day. Was he afraid something might happen or did he simply well, want to be I, there? I'm not sure. I think probably both, little of both. We hadn't done enough planning and he wanted to be there. But John and Jose decided the time was ripe. And did you agree? I wasn't there. I was stayed in Birmingham. I knew Martin wasn't going, so I stayed in my church in Birmingham, and I wasn't there. So uh, John, John and Jose marched, and, and the rest is history. Uh, did you ever think it would turn out the way it did? No. Well, we, we, we felt we'd win the victory. We didn't know how long it would take, but we knew we were right. What about that day? Did you think that it would end in what is now called Bloody Sunday? Oh, no. We, never, we, we expected them to turn us back to turn them back. We really didn't know what to expect uh, on that day, but uh, the troopers were adamant, mean. They had uh, received orders from George Wallace not to let them march, 
And so they met them at the bridge and turned them back. Uh, unfortunately and fortunately, as God would have it, uh, the brutality of, of segregation, the inherent nature of segregation, which is brutal and dehumanizing, was on in everybody's living room across the world. What did it do? It, it, it sent the, the message. The people saw the brutality. And they saw the uh, marchers beaten. They saw them uh, trampled by horses. They saw tear gas. They saw the ugly nature of racial segregation and racial oppression. And people who never would have supported us uh, probably at that point in, in a right to vote saw that they were on the wrong side. That if, if, it, if this is what it means to deny people the right to vote, we don't want any part of that. Uh, we're wrong. Segregation is wrong. And President Johnson uh, was moved by it and determined to, to see the legislation through as he did. Later, decades later, Governor Wallace apologized to you. What was that like? 30 years later, uh, the governor, well, we held reenactments in, in 85, 90, and in 95, the 30th year, uh, I led the group from Selma to Montgomery again. And when we got near Montgomery and St. Jude, the city of St. Jude, a Roman Catholic institution on the edge of the city, uh, the governor said he'd like to meet us there. And he wanted to offer an apology. And so I called the staff together and we had a heated discussion. <laughs> there were some who didn't want to, didn't want to do it. He doesn't deserve it. And, but as a preacher, and as a Christian, uh, I believe in repentance. And I decided we would not stand in the doorway of his repentance. As he stood in the door at the University of Alabama denying black kids uh, an opportunity for education. So he came in a wheelchair and, and sang We Shall Overcome with us on the steps of St. Jude and apologized for his behavior in 1965. Take me back to the mid-60s when there was a lot of rumor and talk that Martin Luther King might just win the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, that, that rumor got out and uh, all of us were excited about it. Uh, Martin had given uh, uh, miraculous leadership. We were just delighted that he might get the Nobel Peace Prize, and we, but we didn't celebrate because uh, it was still an era when there were more negatives than positive, but discrimination was still the order of the day. And we felt he might be overlooked as blacks were overlooked here, there, and everywhere. When you heard he won, what was your first reaction? It was a time to shout. And uh, I regret very much that I could not make the trip. I had commitments that wouldn't let me go, but uh, I was uh, so uh, thrilled. It was almost as though I were receiving the, the prize. And we were very, very honored, and uh, he deserved it. He was our chairperson. He was our leader. And so we, 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 no, there were no jealousies. Uh, it may have been some, but he didn't dare express them if they did. People didn't jockey to be closer to him or his closest oh, yeah, we, we confidant were, we were human beings. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to give the impression that neither Martin or any rest of us uh, are saints. Uh, we were all human beings with all the human frailties that other human beings have. But we were inspired by his leadership. We felt, all felt called by God to participate in the divine journey from, from, from wrong to right, from injustice to justice. And, and uh, we just were glad that God sent Martin. In that respect, how can you measure the impact of his death? Well, I think it's immeasurable. I don't think you can measure it. Uh, it was a great, great loss. Uh, and uh, because so much had centered around him till many people uh, assumed until this day that that was the closing chapter in the movement. <laughs> I think they were wrong, <laughs> but because, because it would have been a disservice to Martin to have let the movement perish. It, uh, it took different shapes and forms. Media interests waned. Uh, they put civil rights from 68 up until now the issue of civil rights on the media scale of, 
of priorities is about two notches below the dart of snail. And uh, uh, with all due respect, of course, for, except for public television. But, uh, but uh, seriously, the, the movement has been a victim of its own effectiveness in many instances for we won a lot of battles. We, we won the battle of the customer side of the lunch counter. We won where you sit on the bus and in public accommodations. The law is on our side now. But the matter of the heart, the matter of the dollar, uh, those issues are still very much uh, relevant. So be very specific with me. What should the civil rights movement be doing today? Well, I think there are three areas that need a great movement uh, 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 involved to change, to, to complete the change. One is the criminal justice system. I think the criminal justice system has probably been the least impacted by social change. Uh, in Georgia, for example, where I live and where Martin was born, spirit, uh, African Americans constitute about uh, a third of the population, general population. But we're two thirds of the prison population. And much of that's due to the fact that blacks are still seven or eight times more likely to be arrested and convicted and imprisoned. The disparities in sentencing, crack, uh, will bring you a hundred times more, 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 more time than powdered cocaine because the poor use crack. Mandatory sentencing is, is, a, is a dark spot in the criminal justice picture. We need to address it. Even some federal judges and even one Supreme Court Justice has said we've got to change that. So the criminal justice system must be addressed. The second one is the area of of, of economics. Uh, we 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 we've made tremendous progress, and and uh, Time Warner and and American Express in the corporate world are headed by African Americans. That's a tremendous uh, progress, and yet. We're, we're less than two-thirds of the median income. And so we've got a long, long way to go. We've, one out of three black families still lives in poverty. Now we've made progress because that means that two out of three do not live in poverty. Probably would be more if we had a more realistic poverty level because where we talk now about four, a family of four living uh, with minimum wage, that's, they're, they're still in poverty. But that's an issue that must be addressed. The third one, and, and a part of that is education, which you acquire skills and knowledge and so forth. But I think there's a bigger picture that, that uh, is a part of the struggle of human rights and, and, and justice. And that's the whole picture of, of war and, and hate and love and, and uh, how we relate to each other as human beings. Uh, I'm saddened and Martin would be saddened that we have a mentality that thinks that we can solve all the global problems by sending smart bums on dumb missions. And it, it can't be resolved. We've got to find a better way to resolve our problems in this world other than through military might. In general, there are many, such as Bill Cosby, who's been very outspoken, who would say that African Americans simply don't value education like they need to, and if they don't, they will never be able to become part of the mainstream. Well, I, I think Bill is more right than wrong uh, in his uh, analysis. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not a racial issue. Uh, poor whites, uh, some Hispanics, don't value education as much. And many of them, uh, however, are victims of, of a system that uh, makes it more difficult for them to, to see the value of education. Uh, we are, uh, we're in this country, class is going to become the next battleground. And we've got to find a way to, to level the playing field and make educational opportunity available to all citizens. I just wish we could put the resources uh, in education and educational opportunity and, and reaching out and providing 
uh, daycare and after school care and so forth so that parents can assist and grow with their children in the educational experience. If we just put half the resources we put uh, in war, in peace, uh, Mart would smile all over heaven. <laughs> <laughs> if you could talk to him today, what would you ask him? But, but I do talk to him. Uh, the question needs to be, what would he say if he talked to me? Because <laughs> he doesn't talk back. Except I, as I read what he said and what he wrote, uh, he still speaks to us. I think we, we, we've lifted Martin up so high and put him on this rotunda of sentimental irrelevancy. Uh, we've taken him out of the marketplace. We quote him on the I Have a Dream speech so much, we don't quote the letter from the Birmingham jail, which is much more relevant today because it speaks to issues that we're not wrestling with. Martin talked about communism and capitalism, and he said neither is ultimately uh, the just answer to our problems. And capitalism, he's, communism makes people servants of the state. Capitalism makes everybody servants of the dollar. We've got to find a better way. And I think that Martin offers a blueprint for us uh, in, this, in this redefining of America that we're not taking advantage of. So he needs, we need to hear his voice today uh, as we try to find new ways to, to help America grow and become the great leader for peace and not the leader for destruction. Many of your civil rights colleagues, like Andrew Young and John Lewis, ran for elected office, and you never did. Why? Well, I, I never got the bug. Uh, that's why I guess I'm the preacher. Uh, God never told me to, to run for office. Uh, I, 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 I admire those who did. I encourage them to run. Uh, I have no problem with preachers running for office. Uh, I think that more people who are committed to that, which is right and ethical and just, ought to offer themselves for office. Uh, so I think uh, uh, John Lewis has made a good congressman. I think uh, Andy made a good mayor and a good congressperson, a good United Nations representative. I, I just, uh, it, it wasn't my baby. Uh, uh, it wasn't my cup of tea. At 83, are you able to judge your life as a success? Oh, I'm sure I, I wouldn't be unbiased and, <laughs> and fair. I'm, I'm not ever going to be rich. <laughs> I'm not ever going to get the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm not ever going to be elected to public office because I'm not going to run. But I've been elected to the presidents of SCLC that when it was uh, committed to what it was born for, and I've been uh, patted on the back by people that I don't even know who said thank you. And that's all the reward I need. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey because I've been trying to sing the Lord's song in this strange land. And that's what the title of my book will be. With that, I have to say thank you so much, Dr. Lowry. Thank I really you. appreciate your time. Thank you. I, I, can I pass the <laughs> offering, please? Yes. This has been a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.